presentation, uh, our another senior resident, Dr. Ashamala, will be talking about sodium bicarb is basically useless during ACLS. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, you already saw your first explosion today, so we're hoping for another one. So just before I start, I want to provide this disclaimer, which is that I'm not arguing that pharmacologic cor correction of acidemia is better than circulatory and ventilatory support. And this is a diagram from the original, you know, Peter Safar's first description of CPR from the early 1960s. So since the first descriptions of CPR in the 1960s, um, the External cardiac massage was obviously the most important part of that new introduction, but the recognition that correction of acidosis went hand in hand with that. So this is from a 1964 paper, but it's quoting actually the 1960 and 1961 studies that first described CPR. And in all the early guidelines, sodium bicarbonate featured fairly heavily um, until about 1986, at which point the AHA backed away fairly strongly, but still included it in all of these guidelines. So you can see here's the, um, the asystole uh, algor algorithm and then the PEA algorithm and then BFib algorithm. Um, so there has been a fairly large paradigm shift in the intervening decades, and actually in 2010, the AHA guidelines said that bicarbonate was not recommended for routine use, although they do make exceptions for special circumstances, and we'll return to this later. Um, so this has led to what I think is akin to a witch hunt against the use of bicarbonate during ACLS. So what, is, what does this mean? What are the things we're going to address during this talk? So should we be giving bicarb at all during ACLS? When should we give it and how much should we give? Um, because there's something of a culture of bicarbonate use among the residents, I went ahead and did a poll. So this is a, a survey of senior medicine residents who have run a code during their tenure here at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. And you can see that the vast majority use bicarb either fairly frequently or almost always, although there's fairly split about whether they think that the data supports its use or omission of its use. I sent the same poll to the ER physicians because they run codes in the ER before we get involved, um, and the majority of them said sometimes they consider it on a case-by-case -case basis, although you can see still about 25% use it either fairly frequently or almost always. And this is based on 21 responses from 37 ER docs that got this survey. And then I surveyed intensive care physicians, and their results were fairly similar to the ER doctors, although there was a little bit more of a yes, almost, almost, almost always or fairly frequently response. And I actually got some very good write-in comments, including this one, I'm always writing by Carbonate Rocks. I have some guesses as to who I think may have put that in, but, you know, haven't. Um, so we can dispense with the rest of the talk now. So in theory, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to follow me on this theoretical pathway just for a moment. So first, acidemia is bad, and we know acidemia is bad. So pH less than 7.2 causes depression of myocardial contractility, decreases responsiveness to catecholamines, which you know you may or may not be administering during your ACLS efforts, um, and actually inhibits acetylcholinesterase, which increases vagal tone. Um, it does very, very much the same thing on the um, vascular system, so your peripheral vascular resistance falls, again, diminished response to catecholamines, although it may actually have the opposite effect on renal and mesenteric vessels, causing gut ischemia and an AKI. Um, many patients are acidemic during their cardiac arrest, and we know that they are, especially if they've been down for a while. So the graph that you see on the right is from a, a study from 1970, and each of those lines represents a dec discrete patient who had serial gases done um, during the phase after their arrest, and you can see that their blood lactate goes up as their pH goes down. Um, so we know that base deficit increases for every minute during cardiac arrest, and that lactate increases, increases more if epinephrine's not being given. Um, and this is taking for granted that your patient was not acidemic to begin with before they ever went down. So these third and fourth, we're gonna use some data to support that later on in the talk, but um, this slide didn't go properly, but the bottom of this should say the case for the omission. So those who argue against the use of bicarb say that there's a risk of an osmolar load and hypernatremia if it's administered. Um, and it's true, an amp of bicarb has 2,000 milliosmoles per liter. Um, and if you give 50 milliequivalents times three amps, you're giving them 150 milliequivalents of sodium. 
But if you actually math this out based on the volume, your total increase, assuming a total body water of 40 liters, which you can dispute in the critically ill patient, um, for every amp you're giving them, you're gonna increase their osms by approximately 2.5 milliosmoles per liter. Um, and for three amps of, of sodium bicarb, your total sodium increase is about 0.56 milliequivalents per liter. There's also the theory that you can cause an intracellular acidosis by shifting this equation to the right, meaning that by giving bicarb, the body turns that bicarb into carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide pressure in the blood goes up, and that diffuses across the cellular membrane. Um, but the increase has been demonstrated to be exceedingly brief, and it's actually mitigated by ventilating the patient appropriately. There's actually recent data to suggest that um, with bicarb ventilation and giving calcium, you can actually improve their intracellular pH. Um, then there's the argument about tissue oxygenation. So bad perfusion leads to buildup of lactate. Lactate leads to decrease in the pH. And acidemia at the tissue level favors dumping O2 because of, you know, we have this hemoglobin dissociation curve and we know that the pH is going to um, shift the curve to the right. So that's the Bohr effect. Um, I would argue that if you are circulating your patient effectively, this is not an issue. And then finally, because the AHA guidelines say so, um, and they cite several studies to support their claim. But the AHI guidelines use flawed data. So if you actually go back and look at all these studies that they've cited, um, the two studies that demonstrate increased ROSC, only one of them actually studies bicarbonate. Um, these, two, these three studies that show no benefit, um, two out of three actually might support bicarbonate use. One says there is no harm. And then of these four that show a relationship with poor outcome, um, one of them draws a flawed conclusion. This slide says study so esoteric that I couldn't find it. Um, not true anymore, and we'll get there in a minute. And then the other two say all drugs, including epinephrine, are associated with worse outcome. And yes, I did used to be a librarian. <laughs> so this is a busy slide, but this is just a graphical representation of all those citations. Um, and I won't go through each of them individually because I'm worried that we'll run out of time. But like I said, these three in the middle here are the ones that say they show no effect on outcome. But one of them actually shows a trend towards improved survival if they're in a prolonged cardiac arrest. Um, one of them says that there's no association between sodium bicarb and rate of ROSC, but the duration of the code prior to ROSC was much greater in the sodium bicarb group. So if you start with a sicker population and you have the same rate of ROSC, I would argue that that's actually better. Um, and then the, the four that say that there's a worse outcome, the overall, um, I think, weakness of those four studies is that none of them correlate for the duration of the code. Because if the person is coding for a longer time, in theory, they're getting more administrations of drugs. So higher use is going to be associated with a worse outcome. So um, this is that study that I could not find, but our librarians helped me out with it. Um, and I think that just the, the, this highlights the misrepresentation of the data from the AHA guidelines. So basically the conclusion of this paper was that the pH was associated with a worse outcome, while um, sodium bicarbonate was, could be used in acidosis. The patients who received it were more severely acidemic. That the bicarb was largely used after everything else had failed. And then this final one, you can see um, the association between the duration of the arrest or the resuscitation effort and outcome is well known. But they could not examine the relative importance of that. They didn't even look at how long that patient had been down before they made that correlation. So the residents probably recognize that I use this meme in basically every talk I ever give, but trust, trust nobody. So then where's the proof? Um, this is from a 2016 review of previous studies on the use of sodium bicarb. Um, and I will save you the explanation of each of these studies individual, but you can see these letters down here on the side. The black ends are neutral, the Gs are good, and the Bs are bad. Um, and then the two bad studies here, so one of these, again, failed to correlate for the, um, the length of CPR and the outcome. And then the other was a case series of 12 patients. 
They say that the average plasma osmolality was greater than 400 milliosmoles per kilo and that sodium concentrations went up to 200 milliequivalents per liter. We've already talked about why I don't think that that's a valid association, but I read this paper and I cannot find any indication of how much sodium bicarb they gave these patients to do this. Um, but like I said, it's a case series of 12 patients. Um, so one of these studies, um, I think, really sums this up nicely. So what this really tells us, and this is from a, um, a large trial, the Brain Resuscitation Clinical Trial, um, and they looked at the amount of sodium bicarbonate that was given per CPR time, and they actually showed a better outcome with sodium bicarb, but they state in their paper that essentially the bicarb use is an epiphenomenon for how long the CPR has been going on and that we need to interpret these results accordingly. Um, and this is just the, this is the same chart with a, the box around those studies because I thought that this was really, um, this was really um, kind of shows nicely the effect of the bicarbonate. And I'll go back just to show you. So these are the biggest studies in this trial. Um, one has 2,900 patients, the other one 2,100 patients. The rest are fairly small by comparison. And they show that the rate of ROSC is higher in the sodium bicarb group, but so is the neurological outcome at time of discharge. Um, and then because that was a 2016 paper, I went ahead and did a review of the literature that has happened since then. And so you can see this is uh, um, five more studies after that review was published, and all of them have green Gs next to them, so that's good news. Um, this was the largest trial I came across, 5,600 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients that were assessed in the emergency department. Um, and what they were looking at was the rate of survival to admission as well as their 30-day mortality. Um, they did not talk about shockable versus non-shockable rhythms, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but um, they did match for tricyclic use. They had the same rate of tricyclic use in both patient populations, and they still showed that the um, bicarbonate was superior. Uh, the last study here is specifically looking at hyperkalemic patients, so those who had an initial K of greater than 6.5 milliequivalents per liter, and they showed higher rate of sustained ROSC in bicarbonate group, um, up to 7.9 milliequivalents, and then a positive association up to 9.4 milliequivalents per liter. And then because we talked about theory earlier, um, this is from one of the studies cited in that um, the 2016 review. It was a retrospective study of 273 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients. And you can see here that the pH is fairly similar in the bicarb and the no bicarb group, as is the base deficit and the sodium bicarb and the sodium itself. Um, but what's interesting is that the bicarb group, if you look at the time of CPR, the no bicarb group had seven minutes of CPR and the bicarb group had 23 minutes of CPR. And still, despite having been down for so much longer, um, the pH was the same in both groups. And then this is another study cited by the AHA to discourage bicarb use, which essentially shows the same thing. Tribonaut's not sodium bicarb. It is another buffer solution, um, which apparently was never available in the US. I think it's from Germany. But um, similar pH in the tribonaut versus saline group, uh, PCO2, sodium, um, and then the osm overlaps in both groups. And then just a note on reversible causes. So when you're running a code and you see PA, you're thinking of your H's and T's. So these items with the stars next to it, um, these are the ones that um, have any association with bicarbonate use. We've already talked a little bit about toxins. I'm not gonna cover bicarb for um, tricyclic overdose because that's a well-established um, that's a well-established association. The hydrogen ion and then the hyperkalemia. And then even if you're not in PA arrest, that study by Bar Joseph actually showed an, a persistent effect whether or not it was a shockable rhythm. So even in the VF or VT group, it's just barely outside of statistical significance for ROSC in the VFib group. Um, it, it was a significant improvement with the um, asystole or PEA arrest, but good neurological outcome was statistically significant in both groups. Um, just a note on potassium, you know, we think of, we give bicarbonate to patients that we think may be hyperkalemic, sorry, um, as well as calcium, but there's some evidence that this is more than just a one-to-one -one exchange effect, that the bicarbonate shifts the potassium into cells regardless of the actual change in the pH. Um, and I ask you to think, you know, when you get to your code, do you know what your patient's potassium is and how sure are you? So 
This study is not specifically about cardiac arrest. This is a very recent study, I think it's from July, um, from The Lancet, the BICAR ICU trial. Um, and their um, primary outcome was looking at 28-day mortality and failure of one organ system at seven days in intensive care patients who were, um, who were or were not put on a bicarbonate drip. Um, and they showed that the composite outcome was not significantly reduced, but if you separated out, looked at 28-day mortality alone, um, it neared significance for the bicarb administration group. Um, and they also noted rapid recovery of pH, more vasopressor free days, and more renal replacement therapy free days in the group that got bicarbonate. So what, so what does this mean? So this paradigm shift that we looked at, um, the routine use of sodium bicarbonate not recommended for cardiac arrest is actually based on fairly crappy evidence, you know? Um, we looked at the studies, and the studies don't say, I think, what the AHA wants us to think that they say. Um, and then they make these exceptions for special circumstances. So hyperkalemia, which, you know, the patient may have if you don't have recent labs, you don't know. Tricyclic overdose, obviously. And then pre-existing metabolic acidosis. But this is probably most of the patients that we're encountering. So should we give bicarb during ACLS? I say yes. Um, the evidence against it is flawed. Um, and we show that it doesn't hurt. So if you don't have anything else above and beyond the ACLS guidelines that you're throwing at them, I say that there's no harm. Um, when should we give it? You didn't talk about this specifically, but the studies that did show uh, improvement with the bicarbonate group did tend to show that if it was given earlier, that it had even uh, better outcomes than if it was given later as a last ditch attempt. Although I will say that it should not be given before any of your other interventions, like good quality CPR, ventilation, shocks if indicated, and epinephrine we can, that'll be the next Mythbusters. Um, and then how much should we give? Um, most of the protocols say starting dose of one milliequivalents per kilo. For most patients, that's about an amp and a half, but use data to guide you further. Um, if you can get a blood gas on your patient, that's gonna help you to know what else you need to be doing. So I wanna finish with a quote from Robert Nairns. Um, he says, the arguments marshaled against bicarbonate therapy are generally based on misconceptions, distortions of experimental studies and flimsy bridges of faith constructed to prematurely apply experimental observations to the care of desperately ill patients. And I will leave you with that. Here's some references. Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, I guess we'll leave that up for now. I'm just curious. I think the two Pittsburgh trials were also out of hospital arrest. Trials? Most of the trials are actually. I was wondering, is there any evidence in hospital that it shows? I actually could not find a lot of in hospital trials. So most of the, the data, especially the, the chart that I showed you with all the G's on it, um, most of those came out of Asia. I think two of them were in Taiwan, one was in Korea, um, and one was in Hong Kong. And they commented that they don't have a lot of pre hospital care. Um, so the, the first responders can do BLS but don't provide any medications. So any medications they get are in the ER. Um, so those patients have been down a lot longer than our average hospitalized patient. Um, there's not a lot of data from in-hospital cardiac arrest. I think a few of the papers in that 2016 review were from in-hospital, but the results were fairly similar, which is surprising. But. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. What is an amp of bicarb cost? That I don't know. What is an amp of bicarb cost? Probably not much. It's Probably not much. But it's sterile. Big yeah, sterile. I don't think it's a cost issue. Yeah. You've already opened a crash cart, yeah. which is much more expensive. <laughs> yeah. Anything? I think once they open the crash cart, they have to ditch all the meds that are. No, they they, they replace. I think they them. restock them. Any other comments, questions? All right, so is it a myth? Sodium bicarbonate is useless in ACLS, which is pretty much what the guideline says or shouldn't be given generally. Um, how many people believe that we should not be using bicarb in ACLS based on what's been presented? How many feel that we maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't? And how many feel that this is busted? So I guess uh, I guess it's busted. 
So. <laughs> Busted.